Good afternoon. My name is Janet Graham, and on behalf of Technology Planning's Diversity Panel, I'd like to welcome you to what we expect will be a thought-provoking seminar. Diversity is about differences, understanding and valuing differences. It's also about inclusion and strengthening our team by capitalizing on the variety of our experiences. Each of us is uniquely shaped by our family, our friends, our religion, our cultural heritage, our environment. At the same time, each of us holds membership in certain groups, and with these groups, we share some common issues. As a white person, I experience the privilege that American society has institutionalized into its culture. I can never understand what it means to be black in America. I can only listen, I can try to gain some insight, and I can value people who have that experience. As a woman, I experience some of the same issues that other women face, and I can understand these issues, but I can never understand what it is to be a man. I can only listen and hope to gain some insight and value those who have that experience. It would be hypocritical if I were to believe that only the issues of groups to which I hold membership have any value. This doesn't in any way diminish the issues that are important to me or keep me from seeking resolution to those issues. I believe our challenge here today is to open our minds to hear, to gain some insight, and to be better able to value all the members of our team. I'd now like to introduce Dan Curry from the Technology Planning Diversity Panel, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Dan. Thank you, Janet. Um, I'd like to go over a couple logistics first about this meeting before we get into our speaker. Uh, this meeting is coming to you live from the Forum in Arlington, but it's going from here to Philadelphia at One Parkway's Auditorium. It's also going to Vail Hall in Newark. And also it's going to about 14 other locations, both conference rooms and assembly areas throughout Bell Atlantic. It's also being broadcast over the Bell Atlantic uh, television network, and that's about, as of today, that's about 107 locations that's going to. For the purpose of, of, of making this run smoothly, the question and answers for this session will be from both here in the, from here in the forum as well as One Parkways Auditorium and Vale Hall in, in uh, Newark. Uh, they, vale Hall and, and the auditorium in One Parkway will have push to talk sets, and that's how we'll handle the question and answers. This presentation is going to run from now till approximately 4 o'clock. At 2.30 there, there will be a break uh, for 15 minutes, and then we'll resume at quarter of 3. At the end of the tape, I will, uh, excuse me, at the end of the presentation, I'll give information how tapes or copies of this presentation can be available on videotape. And now I'd like to tell you a little bit about our speaker. Dr. Warren Farrell is the author of the award-winning national bestseller, Why Men Are the Way They Are, and the recently released The Myth of Male Power. Why Men Are the Way They Are is published in over 50 countries in eight languages. The New York Post called it the most important book ever written about love, sex, and intimacy. Dr. Farrell has appeared on over a thousand television shows, including eight appearances on The Phil Donahue Show, plus repeated interviews with Barbara Walters, Peter Jennings, and Oprah Winfrey. Warren Farrell is the only man in the United States to be elected three times to the Board of Directors of the National Organization of Women. He is also the only man to have been on the board of both the National Congress for Men and the National Congre Council of Free Men. He has started over 100 men's and women's groups, and over 150,000 men and women have attended his workshops worldwide. President Lyndon Johnson chose Dr. Farrell as one of the outstanding young educators in the United States. Uh, you have been around a long while, haven't you? <laughs> uh, he, he has taught political science, psychology, uh, sociology, and most recently taught at the School of Medicine at the University of California in San Diego. Dr. Farrell is frequently quoted in Time, Newsweek, and has written publications from the New York Times to Ms., and has been featured in People, on Real People, in men's journals, on the Wall Street Journal, the Today Show, the Tomorrow Show, and even to tell the truth. So I, <laughs> so I now I, please welcome me in joining Dr. Warren Farrell.
Um, before I start, well, first of all, before I start, let me ask um, if we can move everybody up. And as we're moving everybody up, part of what diversity is about is moving into uncomfortable situations. So I'm going to ask you to sit next to somebody who you don't like, who you have no interest in. <laughs> yeah. So you're already sitting in that group, of course. <laughs> Now, in all seriousness, I'm going to be asking you to, speak, to move up and also to sit next to somebody from uh, ideally a different race and also ideally and or a different sex, either one. So choose somebody from a diverse background to sit uh, next to and then move up into the front rows so we can let new people move in. People in the back rows, I'll ask you to stand up and move up to the, um, to the front rows. Joe handling the microphone, if you could make that a little louder. Before I start, I'd also like to say that I'd like to give credit to Dan Curry and to Janet, who um, Dan, six, seven months ago, um, began the contacting of me and making plans and to uh, organizing this and um, talking about it to the diversity um, panel and group and uh, working this program out in all its details. And so I'd like to ask us to give him and Janet um, some acknowledgement for the work that they've done. Uh, Dan mentioned that a bit of my background was spending three years on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City and speaking basically on women's issues exclusively for about 10 years during the 70s and early 80s. And in that process of speaking around the world and trying to articulate women's issues, I think what we've accomplished in the last 25 years is that the feminist movement has done a wonderful job freeing women from stereotyped sex roles. But in the process, no one has freed men from stereotyped sex roles. And so a lot of what I'll be looking at, so as, as we started developing diversity issues over the past 25 years, we began to um, help each other understand blacks, understand Hispanics, understand women, understand groups that weren't typically represented in the workplace. But as we did that better and better and increasingly sensitized the workplace to that group of people, we forgot that a gr one group of people was not prone to speak out about their sensitivities at all. Their attitude toward the world was when the going got tough, the tough got going. And that group had learned not to express feelings. It had spent all its life training and hazing each other to discount the feelings of criticism that were, were put its way and to, let it, and to let it go off of its back. That group, called white males in particular, learned not to speak out, that it was unmanly to do that. They didn't learn that the man who expressed their vulnerabilities was the man that the woman wanted to dance with. They didn't learn that the, um, the, the man that said to the sergeant, gee, sergeant, but you know that comment that you made about, about men was not really a comment that I appreciated because in my sensitivity training, that was really not uh, valued very much. <laughs> He learned that, his, that basically if he made a comment like that, the foot of the sergeant would be in his crotch and, and, he, would, and he would be out the door and that would be about the, size, the end of his sensitivity training for, the, <laughs> for quite a long period of time, except in the areas that were sensitive. Um, <laughs> So what I, um, what, is, what I began to do as I started working on men's and women's issues is real, beginning to understand that, that while at the 25 years ago, we had a real inability to understand and to hear women and minorities, and an enormous bias toward women and minorities, that over the course of the years, something was being left out of the balance, and that was the perspective of the white male. And it's interesting that as I started to, to understand this, 
I did this, uh, began the understandings of this in part when I was running some of the men's groups and the women's groups that I was starting. And at the beginning of the men's groups and the women's groups, I would say to the men, you know, open up and express your feelings. But when the women's groups expressed their feelings, um, and particularly when they were critical of men, I would sort of reinforce their criticism as being part of liberation, and I would call it often insight. Um, but when the men expressed feelings of criticism about women, I would call it sexism, male chauvinism, backlash, defensiveness. And then I would wonder why the men didn't open up and express their feelings. <laughs> And it's kind of embarrassing to acknowledge that as somebody trained in this area, but it wasn't until I, I listened to the audio tapes of the groups that I had started and saw what I was doing that it became so obvious that it's almost embarrassing to report out the, the process of that. As I began to hear men more effectively and articulate what men said to groups, I began to start seeing that instead of, for the first 10 years when I was speaking, I was only speaking about the women's perspective. I had, after four or five years, I was able to hone my presentation effectively enough so that I could count on a standing ovation. The first time, because the more you say whatever what somebody wants to hear, the more that they give you applause for saying what they want to hear. Um, and so, but for the first time that I was able to hear men and started to, to run back my groups and see what I was missing, I started incorporating some of men's perspectives and I lost my standing ovation. And I started to begin to start dealing internally with, uh-oh, what part of me needs applause versus what part of me needs to tell the truth? And it was a very difficult time in my life as I, as I started seeing that this was not just a ego thing, it was also a monetary thing. When I was speaking only from the woman's perspective, I could count on three or four invitations to speak to another group from each, for each group that I spoke at. When I started to bring in also the men's perspective, balancing it with the woman's perspective, I was down to zero to one invitation after each presentation. And so people who liked me were encouraging me to forget about incorporating the men's perspective and go back because for love to them meant supporting my career. But love of myself meant a tear between the part of me that wanted to have a career supported and the part of me that, that started to get letters from some women who said, I walked out of your presentation. One woman wrote me and said, I went home to my husband and he said, what are you doing home so early? I thought you were, he wasn't doing anything bad. but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he said, you know, what are you doing home so early? I thought you weren't coming home until about 11, and she had come home about 9.30. And she said, oh, I listened to that Warren Farrell speak, and he was talking about men not having all the power that we thought that they had. I was sort of disgusted, and he said, well, what else did he say? And she said, I said to my husband uh, three or four things, and he said, my God, it's the first time I've ever felt understood in this relationship. And so she said, we came back to another of your presentations, but this time together, and it really had created the first real dialogue of real honesty that we've had. I can tell you it wasn't without fights, but after that dialogue was over, I think we feel closer than we've ever felt before. Why don't you take some of that material and put that more honest material and balanced material in writing? So uh, over the period of the next year or two, I did. I sent it out to publishers. The publisher's response to me, the first 11 or 12 publishers wrote back almost identical letters, somewhat to the effect of, what you're saying we've never thought about before, I guess it's true from our everyday life, it's, it holds up, but the truth is that 90% of the relationship books are bought by guess which sex? Women, and, um, and, that the, and that we need, to, and that the basic formula that sells best is a formula that in essence says, women good, men not so good successful woman, but the man is what? The foolish, s successful woman, foolish, smart women, I'm sorry, smart women, foolish, foolish choices. Guess which group is the foolish choice? <laughs> men, right? Um, it's, um, it's the women who love too much. If the women have a problem, it's that they love too much. Who do they love too much? These jerks that can't love them back equally. Women who love men and the men who, who, um, who, who, um, who hate them. Now imagine the reverse of that. Imagine going into a man's home, you were just starting to date, and he was reading a book saying, men who love women and the women who hate them. <laughs> and he had the gall to call this a self-improvement book. <laughs> Would you be fearful of continuing the relationship with him? Of course, because you knew that he was participating in self-deception, not self-improvement. And so you would, you would start looking at the, uh, so that, me, so that the, the publishers were basically being very honest with me. They were saying, women buy these books. They buy these books oftentimes when they're hurting, 
When they're hurting, they need self-assurance. They don't need self-reexamination. Uh, they need some re-examination, but the predominant thing that appeals to them is the self-assurance. And I began to realize that that was true for either sex. It's not women that do this alone, but both sexes in the area where they are rejected tend to turn what rejects them into an object. So the area where men are most rejected, the area where we're most rejected is likely to be in the area of sexuality. So we turn women into sex objects because it hurts less to be rejected by an object than it does to be rejected by a full human being. If you say, gee, that woman who rejected me uh, was just a blankety blank, that's a lot easier than saying a really intelligent, thoughtful, caring, insightful woman that I went out with last night rejected me. I can see why. <laughs> <laughs> Conversely, if the, if the man uh, feels rejected by the, the um, if the woman feels rejected by the man, it's, it's a lot easier for her to say, uh, he was foolish choice A or foolish choice B, he was a man who couldn't love enough, he was a man who hated women, women than to say, gee, there's a really intelligent, thoughtful, caring man that I went out with last night, um, he rejected me. She's much more likely to say, he was a jerk, because it hurts less to be rejected by a jerk than it does to be rejected by a full human being. And so both sexes turn into objects those people who reject them because it hurts less to be rejected by an object. We do this with races, we do this with sexes, we do this with anyone that we perceive threatens us or rejects them. We objectify them first and then we bomb them later. So what I began to sort of do is to question myself. I really had my midlife crisis um, of going through, do I want to focus on career success or do I want to focus on telling something that I thought was the best version of the truth that I could come up with? And at, the, at about that time, another incident in my life happened. I got a call one day from my dad and he said, would you sit down? And I did. And he said, your brother has just been killed. And as I went to the funeral, the woman friend that he was, he was involved with said, um, I asked her, how did this happen? And she said, well, we had gone up skiing in the Grand Tetons together. And he, my brother had been a ski instructor. And so had she been. And he said there was a danger, she said there was a dangerous area. And so he said that he would go out and explore it to check out whether or not it was safe. And as it turned out, there was an avalanche while he was exploring the area that he thought might be subject to avalanches. And he was buried 40 feet under. And it took me, with all the work that I was doing in this area, it took me four to five years to register the fact that as I was writing about the male protector role, that reflexively he had volunteered to go out and check out the danger. Reflexively, she and he had volunteered to have him alone go out and check out the danger, even though the two of them checking out the danger together might have been able to be eyes and ears that would have been able to save each other. And I started thinking of the tragedy or the automatic reflexiveness of that, and that that evening, as this was sort of registering for me, I had already volunteered to go downstairs to check out whether the person that, the, the, the noise downstairs, um, my woman friend and I were sleeping upstairs, and downstairs there were some noises, and I had volunteered to go downstairs to check out what it was about. She did not go down with me. I did not ask her to go down with me. Um, she did not ask herself to go down with me. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and so I began to look at myself and say, gee, it's very fascinating how this, re this reflexive de protector role is built into both sexes so automatically. And yet I wonder whether I should really be calling it male power to be willing to volunteer to die sooner. <laughs> Did my brother have more power now that he's dead than his woman friend who's now remarried? Or married, I'm sorry. And so those questions began to sort of be little seeds that happened for me. And some people asked me sometimes, well, Warren, what made you change to be, you know, to sort of be understanding of men? And oftentimes in their voice, I'll hear, are you anti-woman? Or is there something now that has happened to you in your life that's made you opposed to women? And it's such a sad question because the question re reflects that if you understand a black person, you must be anti-white. Or if you understand a gay person, you must be gay and, and, and suddenly turned away from being heterosexual. If you understand women, you must be opposed to men. Or if you understand men, you must be opposed to women. I hope what diversity training is about is about exactly the opposite conceptualization of that. 
But something happened to me in a workshop that I'm going to be sharing with you and having you share with each other in a few minutes that was probably the most powerful single paradigm shift creator for me of anything that's happened so far. And it, it was this. I had spent, during the years I was working solely on women's issues, I was working on um, five hours of work that I had done on working on empowering women to, and we were defining power as the ability to control one's life, which involved the woman going inside of herself, determining what her values were, where she wanted to go with her life, and then what she could do personality-wise and character-wise to create that outcome and to confront the external obstacles as well as the internal obstacles to do that. But the men in the group were playing roles with these women of learning how to empower women, which oftentimes you and I as men, as problem solvers, our tendency is if, you if you're our wife and, sh and you have a problem, we will not really listen to you. We'll listen to you for a couple of seconds, pick up the gist of what you're saying, and while you're talking, we'll try to form in our, our own mind's eye a problem, we'll find try to define your problem and try to solve it for you while you're talking and then we'll sort of nod you to a pause the moment that you are sort of moving toward a, a sort of down part of your voice and then we'll sort of interrupt with the solution and we think we've helped you. But in fact what we've done is condescended to you and we basically said to you don't worry in five seconds we can solve what you took five months to not be able to solve. And the woman doesn't feel empowered by that, but she feels disempowered. So I was working on that concept, that type of concept and interaction between men and women around the issues of em empowerment. Same type of thing holds true with races, that type of attitude that one race can solve the problem, the other race cannot, um, that is, is underneath all that an attitude of condescension. Um, so the, having done that, I got ready to take a break and looked up at my workshop audience of about 150, and I said, by the way, how many of us here have ever asked our dad the following question? Dad, if you didn't have me and the family to support, what would you have liked to have done with your life? And about three people in the group of 150 answered the question, raised their hand and said they had ever asked that question of their dad. I'd like to ask here, for us to raise our hand if we've ever asked that question of our dad. Dad, if you didn't have me and the children to support, what would you have loved to have done with your life? About four people. How many have, raise your hand if you think it's a question that might be useful to know the answer to. Okay. What, as we thought about that, and a lot of people who select themselves to go to my workshops are into psychology and into open my openness to these issues. There was a bit of embarrassment that came over us. And, and we began to start seeing that for 10 years, or I started to see that for 10 years, I had been really defining power as empowering somebody to determine what they wanted to do to control their life. We had applied this question to every group I knew of, but we hadn't applied this question to our fathers be they black or white or Hispanic. Um, but so we hadn't really looked at that question for men. We had largely looked at that question just for women for the past 25 years. So I'm going to ask us in a few moments to get together, actually I'm going to ask us right now, to get together in a group of three. But I'm going to ask us not to get together in a group of three with only men, white men, or only black men, or black women, or white women, or whatever, but to, to mix the group up a little bit, have some diversity in it. When you're in the group of three, I'll be asking you to, um, to get together and have eye contact, with the maximum amount of eye contact with each other. So rearrange the chairs in triangular, triangular fashion so you have maximum amount of eye contact with each other. I'll be asking the people in Newark and Philadelphia to also do the same thing in all the, the various locations, have somebody facilitate people to do that. I will also ask you to raise Raise your hand if you can't find a third member of the group. Do not get together in groups of four. Do not get together in groups of two. So I'll just ask you to um, stand up and to find a, a member, three people for that group. I'll ask you, Joe, can you uh, raise that volume now? Really? 
raise your raise your hand if you have if you're in groups of two or four. If you need a partner, raise your hand. This do you have two? Okay. Um, we need one more for this group down here. Is there any other person that needs a partner? We need. Do you have partners here? And the other locations, the same thing. If you ha if you're in groups of two or four, break up and get into groups of three. Do you have a group of three? Okay. I'll now ask you in your group of three to get to have maximum amount of eye contact with each other. So close the circles. So I'll ask you to um, and with this group move away a little bit so that they can close their circle. Good. Very good. Close your circles in Newark and Philadelphia also. I will be using, I will be doing two experiences during this, um, I'll be doing two experiences during this um, today. And I'll use the word during experiences, the word hold, which when you hear the word, word hold, I'll ask you to put your conversation on hold so I can give the next level of instruction so I can keep moving things along at a quick pace. The, I will now be asking you to think to yourself right now about three things that you'll be sharing with the group in a minute. And I'll be giving some instructions, particularly about the second thing. The first I'll be asking you to share with the members of the group what your dad actually did. The second thing, what you think your dad might have loved to have done if he could have done anything he wanted. And that's the thing I'll be giving you more direction about in a minute. And the third thing I'll be asking you to share with the group is how you arrived at that conclusion since you haven't asked your dad. <laughs> And I'll be sort of working with you on how to arrive at that conclusion in a moment. If your dad has passed away or you never knew your dad, I'll ask you to pick up on the images and the discussions that you heard about your dad to make a best guess. I'll work on that more in a moment. Whether you know you knew your dad or not, I'll ask you to remember to, to use the following types of things as possible hints. Maybe one day you were going through the attic and you ran across, for example, a trombone or an old saxophone or a picture of your dad in a family album. And in that family album, you saw him maybe fishing or hiking or doing something that you didn't see him do very much of in his later life or as you knew him growing up. Or maybe you remember a time when your dad started speaking about something he was doing or did when he was younger and all of a sudden a different energy came over him, a glint came into his eye that you often didn't notice in him every day. Or maybe on the negative side of things, one day he came over, uh, came home drunk, and in the passing stages of his drunkness, he made some quick comment like, if it weren't for you and the kids, I would have been doing blank. <laughs> and take from that painful memory I'll be asking you now to take from that painful memory what the pain was that he was experiencing that perhaps contributed to his drinking and think about the hope that he may have been have had when he was younger that of what he didn't fulfill perhaps and now I'm going to be asking you when you share this in the group in a moment to not say two things to not be saying well my dad did exactly what he wanted to do because the reason I'm asking you not to say that as a starter is because if in 1950 we asked all the women of America to say what they wanted to do, almost all the women would have said, I want to be a mother and a homemaker. And the feminist movement correctly told us, you can't really say that's what women want to do until you give them social approval for being able to do anything that they want to do. And in the 1950s, there wasn't social approval for the woman to be the doctor, the lawyer, the engineer. There was social approval for her to be basically a mother or maybe a teacher for a while and then a mother after that. And so if you only give a people approval to do one thing, you can't tell them that that's what they want to do. What you're really saying that they want is approval. As of now, our fathers grew up learning that they had to make an income to support a woman and children. And so they only had the framework of approval to choose something that produced an income, enough income, not only to support themselves, but also to support a, a wife with potential children. And as many children, oftentimes pre-birth control, as came about from the sex that they had. 
oftentimes, if it was the end of last century, that was your grandfather, oftentimes in an environment in where the average person lived to the age of 52 or 53 because they died of diseases from poverty and famine and whatever. So the issue for our fathers and particularly our grandfathers was the issue of survival and what the man learned was that his role was to raise money. It wasn't an option, it was an obligation. And so I'll be asking you to think about that, uh, what he obligated himself to do in order to prepare himself to raise enough money and to give yourself freedom to choose among the hobbies, among the sports, among the traveling. Maybe your dad had a little bit of an inventor in him and you saw that through the hobbies and the tinkering that he did. Maybe he loved sports or fishing and you saw that through the fishing that he, a little bit of the fishing that he could get in. And but as you went back through the albums or you heard the stories, you heard that he did more of that before he was married and had children than he did later. And would he have loved to just have spent his life doing that? Did that perhaps create some of the anger, the resentment, the hurt that got carried out to you in a different type of way. So, okay, that's enough on the second part. The first part you're going to be sharing then with the group in a second is what your dad did. The second is what you think your dad might have loved to have done. And then the third, um, how you got to that conclusion. Before we start that, I'm going to ask you to take one minute of silence just to get those answers in your own mind's eye so you won't be thinking about them while the rest of the group is talking. So I'll ask you to just go internally with that for one minute. Ready? Go at the for the minute. I'm now going to ask each group to choose one person in the group to, who has a watch with a second hand to be the group's timer. Philadelphia, Newark, would you facilitators make sure you're doing that also? Ready, hold. I'm now going to ask the timer to signal to one person to start. The timer will give each person two minutes. At the end of two minutes, no matter where you are, just move to the next person and come back if there's room at the time at the end uh, to finish off with the people who uh, were cut short. So we'll keep it to a very strict six minutes. Timer, look at one person, give him or her the signal. Ready, get set. Remember, you're going to be sharing with the group three things, what your dad did, what your dad might have loved to have done, how you got the hints about that. Ready, get set, go, timer.
public appearances. And um, I think if he had a chance, if he hadn't had to do certain things early on in his life to help support uh, his brothers and sisters, I think he, he would have been very good in, in any kind of uh, uh, management or uh, legal profession or uh, any type of uh, professional area where his uh, leadership skills and his, uh, his presence, his sense of presence would have been uh, an asset. Uh, He liked to do. He liked to travel out with his uh, brothers and maybe go to a hunting or a firing range. Or, um, he liked athletics. He was very good at athletically, a swimmer and other things. So, do I have any time left? <laughs> no, you got. You're fine. What else am I saying about him? Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Testing. Ready, hold, 
I'll ask us to um, hold and to move the uh, chairs directing this way again. If you're sitting in the back, take this moment or opportunity to come up front and use the front rows so you'll have a, a better view and listening shot. If you're sitting in the back, just come on up and use the front rows. I'm going to ask you to uh, raise your hand, say your name, and just to volunteer what you shared with the group about what your dad did versus what you think your dad might have loved to have done if he could have done anything he wanted to do. And then third, um, how you got to that conclusion. Would somebody start us out? And somebody in Newark or, or uh, Philadelphia can also volunteer. Yes, S say your name, and would, and would you stand up? My name is Leonard Stevens. Uh, my dad uh, was a construction worker for the better part of his working career, and he subsequently retired. One of the things that I think that he would have liked to have done as a profession would have been a professional singer. He was a gospel singer. And uh, the reason I know that is because uh, even during his working years, he was with the group, and when they would perform, he was like a different man. You could see it in his eyes that he really enjoyed it. So that was how I was able to determine that that would be his profession. Very beautiful. How, think for a moment about the building we're sitting in and that it, like all construction sites, average one construction, around the United States, there's one construction worker who dies every workplace hour and feel how we oftentimes put through the, the positive part of diversity programs is that we're making people sensitive to the insensitivities of dirty jokes. And yet the oftentimes we miss is the fact that we haven't put that same type of effort into protecting men from faulty rafters that lead to their deaths. And that we have as many people dying in the workplace every day as we had dying in Vietnam every day. And so we're often unconscious to the, those facts here in Bell Atlantic, the people that do the hazardous work are the same types of people called males that do the hazardous works in every professions. They're the, the splicers, the, the installers, the repairers, the linemen. Those are the people that don't have beautiful offices to come into. They have garages to come into. They're often the ones that um, end up with the, hazard, the hazards. In each profession, that's true to the point where 94% of the people who are killed in the workplace are men. And so part of what Leonard is experiencing or talking about as a dad, that he saw light up when he could sing, when he could be art, artistic. We often think about men not being artistic, not being humanistic, not being into the, the, science, the, 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 the uh, humanities. In fact, even today, 85% of the art historians preparing to be art historians in colleges are which sex? Women. And 85% of the engineers preparing to be engineers in colleges still today with equal opportunity are which sex? Men. And you see the reflection of that right here um, at Bell Atlantic. So thank you, Leonard. Very, very important um, parallel. Somebody else that might um, volunteer? Say, say your name. Hello, I'm Barbara Nissel. Um, my dad was born in 1920, Depression, upstate New York, and was a farm boy. So at 18, he enlisted in the Navy. And he went to the Navy because he knew if he did his 20 years, he'd have his bean and bacon money. And during the Navy, when he was 21, he met my mom, who was a waitress. And they got married and subsequently had four daughters. At 38, he saw the Navy changing. And he decided he was still young enough he could change himself. So he went to college, and he had a 16-year-old daughter at the time. So he, he told, and I've talked with him about this, he told me what he really would have loved to have gone into was forestry because he had such a love of nature and being outdoors. But at A&I College in Texas, they did not offer that degree, so he chose to become a teacher of U.S. history and government instead, uh, partly because he could still travel and go out, and partly he felt he could help young people with all his experiences in traveling in the Navy. Um, he then 
went through teaching, and again, he left that profession, and after that, he kind of drifted, and he retired early, and my mom actually ended up going back to work when I was 13 and uh, working the rest until her retirement. Mm -hmm. So very, very diverse changes there. Very good. Thank you for sharing that, Barbara. That's very nice. Someone else would like to share a thought? Um, anybody in Philadelphia or Newark also? Joe or Russ? Yes, say your name. My name is Wendell Sims. Uh, my father had a restaurant, and uh, I was sharing with the group that one of the reasons he went into the restaurant business that uh, when my sister went to school, he wanted to have something that, that looked good to put down on the, uh, on the forums when he had to uh, say, what is your father's occupation? Because before that, he had you know, pretty much uh, survived, I'll put it that way. And uh, so the restaurant was a family business, but what he really wanted to be was a politician. And uh, he used his, re his restaurant as a soapbox uh, place. <laughs> and uh, anybody who had come there knew his views about anything that was going on at the time. Mm -hmm. And I know for sure that he really wanted to be a politician because he told me that if he had had the education and the writing and, and reading skills that I had, that he would definitely be in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. as a politician. <laughs> Or maybe the lack of education, lack of, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Poor politicians, they get a bad rap. Thank you very much, Wendell. It's really a nice comparison. Um, anybody else? Okay, let me um, share what I, as I've heard these stories um, from various groups around the country, one of the things I begin to see is a number of patterns that emerge. One is that the first was an own criticism of my own analysis and understanding of what I was doing uh, speaking around the world as a male feminist was uh, I would often interestingly enough I'd get into a cab to go to a radio or TV show and the cab driver would say oh, I'm taking you to a TV show huh what are you doing you go on TV and I'd say yeah and he'd say um, oh what you what you're talking about and I'd say well why men are the way they are the myth of male power he said boy male power is a myth and he'd go on for a half hour and, uh, <laughs> and uh, and in the process, when I opened my ears enough to listen to him, he'd say to me something along the lines of, you know, um, what I really wanted to do was be a writer too. I was amazed at how often I heard that. And how many of you think your dads might have wanted to be some type of writer or um, something along those lines, or in the arts, arts or history? Um, raise your hand if your dad might have wanted to be something in sports or um, adventure, outdoors. Raise your hand if your dad might have wanted to do something like inventing something creative like that. Um, what about into singing or music or um, along those lines? What I, what I saw all over the country was that a lot of men wanted to do things that were a lot more creative, a lot more humanitarian, a lot more oriented in the social sciences, um, and yet they, this, like this cab driver was telling me, he, I, so I said, well, why didn't you become a writer? And he, and he sort of laughed at me as if he had a condescending, condescending laugh of this little academic in the back seat, right. <laughs> I think you really understand a lot about life, mister. Um, and um, and, <laughs> and he's saying to me, um, you know, I had a wife and I had children and I have three kids. I have to support them, boy. Um, and um, <laughs> and, uh, and he's, you know, he continued and he said, so I, when I, you know, got over the criticism implied in his tone, um, I, was, I would get enough guts to say to him something along the lines of, um, well, you know, how many hours a week do you work? And the first time the, the, the cab driver told me 70, I thought, well, exception to the rule. The second time he told me 70 or 75, I thought exception to the rule. And when I got that over and over again and tested and cross-examined to make sure I was getting some credible answers, I was finding 60, 65, 70, 75 hours a week was the norm. And that started making me ask some questions. And the questions basically were, I was looking as I was going to this TV show to talk about how men were oppressors and women were oppressed. I was at the same time hearing this cab driver, this limousine driver, tell me something. And one time I was doing this show with a feminist and we were going to the, to the, to the um, with, with a limousine going to the TV studio. And the feminist and this guy, he was an anthropology um, master's degree uh, background. And the two of them were going back and forth about male, female anthropology around the world and had a wonderful discussion. And, and, um, and it, and she made a comment to her, I wish all guys were like you. Uh, you know, the world would be a lot better place. And she got out of the car and said, well, he's single, you're single. Why didn't you ask him for his, um, you know, a card or give him a card? And she looked at me and she realized he was invisible. He was a chauffeur driver. 
she was a famous feminist. From her perspective, without even understanding it, he was not eligible for her love because he did not have enough success to be eligible, but she never articulated that, but she was smart enough and honest enough to acknowledge it as we talked about it on the way back to, for, between the chauffeur and the, and the TV studio. We got back in with the same limousine driver and she still didn't ask him though. <laughs> okay, so what I was beginning to start understanding was that here I was saying men had the power and women didn't. What I didn't realize was that historically speaking, from the perspective of power meaning control over our own lives, like I was working with a women's group to do, that neither sex historically had power. Both sexes historically had roles. And roles that you have to play are not power. They are obligations. Power is about determining what you want your options to be, looking inside of yourself and deciding what to do with that. So, but the female and male obligations were different, obviously. The female's obligation was uh, raise, uh, raise children. The male obligation was basically raise money. But what I, as a feminist, did is I looked at the female obligation of raised children, and I called that obligation powerlessness. I called it, oftentimes in my radical moments, slavery. I called it sacrifice. In the positive moments, I called it contribution. But I took the male role of raise money, and I, instead of calling it sacrifice, obligation, contrib contribution, I ignored the cab driver's sacrifice. And I called it instead privilege and power. And he has the whole pie and patriarchy and sexism and dominance. And I allowed him and encouraged him to feel guilty about the obligation he had incurred to feed, the, to, to, to feed his children and to feed his wife and he didn't, and so to the point where the whole country started to say, men earn more than women do, even if it's for different work, and accusing him of making more money instead of saying, thank you for coming home late at night from work and contributing to the ability of this family to, to, to eat more effectively or to send the kids to college. What I was hearing from the cab driver was saying that I want my kids not to have to drive a cab 70 hours a week. I want their life to be better than my life is. And as he began to understand that, he didn't worry about his power, he worried about the empowerment of his children. He was only hurt when his wife didn't appreciate it, when the culture didn't appreciate it, when his children grew up rebelling against everything he was because he couldn't communicate effectively enough. Why? Because if he communicated effectively enough and he got in touch with his feelings, he would have to acknowledge the pain that he was going through and he wouldn't be able to tough it out. If he went to a psychologist and got in touch with who he was, that would be dysfunctional for pro providing for what he wanted the children to become. So while his wife was criticizing him for not being able to go to the psychologist, and he wasn't able to go to the psychologist, he in internally knew that he couldn't afford to re-examine the whole ball of wax. Otherwise, his obligations would be allowed to go down. And I saw this when I asked this question of my own dad. When I had discovered this question for the group, I hadn't asked my own dad this question. And when I asked my own dad this question, he smiled at me, his condescending smile. Dads never do that, of course. But, um, he, um, and he said, um, you know, Warren, life isn't about choice and option. I've been trying to tell you that for years. It's about obligation and responsibility. And then I remembered that he was, he's 84 now. In 1945, he had been through a depression and two world wars. He was 35 in 1945. He had been through a depression and two world wars. If he, at the age of 35, had thought in terms of becoming a writer, most writers can't support themselves, no less a family. Um, and he even tells me today, don't worry if your next book doesn't smell, sell, smell. <laughs> if it doesn't sell, you could always get a job. Um, <laughs> And so he knew that he couldn't support a family from writing or doing something like that, so he had to take a job, in his case an accountant, that he could depend upon supporting a family with.
So what I had done is to not understand that I was calling something power that men had really learned internally was to the, what they needed to do to sacrifice to create the ability of somebody else to, um, to support the family. And I be that began to allow me to see the connection between the work that I was beginning to discover and the work I had discovered through Betty Friedan. Uh, with, when she wrote The Feminine Mystique in 1963, one of her contributions was saying that women all over the United States and in industrialized nations around the world are beginning oftentimes to feel depressed. They have a stationary, station wagon, they have children, they have a home, they have everything that they think that they want, but the middle class female is still nevertheless feeling, feeling depressed. And so she, as a middle class female, said, what the problem is for many women is that they have a problem that has no name. And so in, in, in not being able to identify it, they weren't able to feel understood. Well, it is also true of men, but something different is true of men that is parallel to that. The difficulty in working with us guys is that we have a problem that has a deceptive name. The problem is that our experience of obligation and sacrifice and powerlessness has been called power. So we have learned to call it power to earn more money that somebody else spends while we die sooner. A woman growing up, if she said, listen, the mom and dad said, listen, you should, have, um, you should earn more money that somebody else spends while you die sooner, and that's your power. She'd be smart enough to look at her mother and say, mom, you're in another world. Or we learned in other ways to call something power. Imagine, for example, coming over here today, coming to work this morning, if you were listening to your favorite radio station, and it got interrupted, and somebody said that President Clinton, or let's say a few years ago, President Bush were coming on, and for some reason you decided not to switch stations. And, uh, and President Bush said, or President Ray, uh, uh, Clinton said, as of tomorrow, I am introducing to Congress a new piece of legislation which will require that as of tomorrow, only blacks will have to register for the draft. Feel the feeling that would go through you. What is the oppressive organization that would come to mind within a second if he said that? The KKK? If he said, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. What I meant to say is that as of tomorrow, only Jews will have to register for the draft. Think of the political leader that would come to mind. It would be Hitler. He said, I'm sorry, I made another mistake. What I meant to say was that you know how Hillary and I believe so strongly in affirmative action and equality, and so therefore, because we have figured out that 1.2 million American men have died in American wars, that as of tomorrow, we will be only draft, registering for the draft females until 1.2 million American females die in, America, in American wars and we have equality. For how many minutes do you think Clinton would be re-electable? <laughs> if he's re-electable. Um, <laughs> Now, interestingly, in that last question, almost every woman here would know that if he made that statement, that he wouldn't be reelectable tomorrow. Because women are, have had the perception and the understanding of power to know that if they were selected out to possible, for possible death based on their characteristics at birth, that they would know enough not to call that power. Blacks would know enough not to call that power if they were selected out based on their characteristics at birth. Jews would know enough not to call that power. The question that I'm asking us is, why have oh, there's only one group of people who can get selected out based on their characteristics at birth, a group called men who have learned to call power what any other group would know enough to call genocide? And that's a group called men. And so, the problem of us working with men is that we have learned to call something power that any other group knows enough to recognize as a type of obligation which if singled out alone to do that would not be called power but and and they wouldn't be they wouldn't be fooled by being given little medals to die and given little p stripes so for the possibility of getting a little bit higher in a hierarchy if if they take more risks of death but the larger truth is that the world was not about power for either sex historically. Women, when they were born, also learned to risk their life. They learned that they had an obligation, that, that raising children was not historically a choice for women. It was an obligation. Just try to get away with it without doing it 100 years ago. 
find out what happened to you, you'll know what a witch is. Um, that's basically what the, the witches were chosen from populations of people who refused to have children, who refused to get married. So when you try to buck the system and not get married, but what did ch childbearing mean to children, historically speaking? It meant the risk of what? The risk of life, the risk of death, the risk of the end of life. And so women were expected to also risk their life in something that they learned to call fulfillment. But now women are smart enough to know that if I said to you, listen, you will be more feminine if you have 14 children than one, you'll have more power if you have 14 children rather than one, you'd say, excuse me, Dr. Farrell, how about more work if I have 14 children rather than one? Don't tell me I'll have more power and be more feminine if I, have, if I supervise 14 children rather than one, but we as men are still learning today that we'll have more power if we supervise 14 people rather than one. And when I, my former wife is um, the number two person at Union Pacific, and, um, and her, if she gets another promotion, if she got another promotion, if she wanted another promotion, she'd be the chairman of the board of Union Pacific. And I said to her the other, the other uh, few weeks ago when I went to visit them, her and her, her new husband, um, I said to her, are you interested in becoming chairman of the board of Union Pacific? And she also laughed at me. And she said, <laughs> uh, and she said Warren, I have all the money I need. What I need is time. I need time to spend with Bill, her current husband, time to spend with the children, time to travel, time to spend the money, time to have a balanced life. Now, she didn't go on and on like I'm doing now. She said this more gradually. Uh, but the, in, the, in essence, she said, what I think of, she gave me an answer that told me how healthy and balanced she was and that she really understood what power was about. That power was about the ability to control her own life, not enslaving herself to go to the next level because it would look better and break through the glass ceiling and somebody would say how wonderful it is that you, even as her home life deteriorated. What happened then in the last 25 years is that we analyzed as men have the power and men are the patriarchs and we live in a patriarchal system. That was our analysis. When I would like to suggest a fundamentally alternative analysis that I think the closer you get to it, the more sense it will make to us, is that the world was not about men oppressing women or women oppressing men. It was about rather what I call stage one. It was about in stage one survival. The oppressor, if you will, which was not an oppressor, was the needs to survive. And if you wanted more blacks or more Nor Mormons or more Catholics or more Jews, you encouraged your black population, your Mormon population, your Jewish population, or your Catholic population to have, get married and to have children and to protect the children that they, that they had. And you knew that if you did enough of that, you'd have more of your group that, and your group would survive. And so you obligated in your socialization process your boy child to take care of raising that money and your girl child to, to get married and to have the children. Um, and that was basically the way of the world. And the, the part of that socialization process was to socialize the girl to fall in love with what type of male? A male who was sensitive, caring, loving, and open and vulnerable? How many, what's that? Successful, Successful type of male. Uh, somebody who was able to either be a prince or a provider. So we never had a, a legend which suggested that the conscience, that the, that the, the prince, the beautiful princess would fall in love with the conscientious objector. We taught people, girls all around the world that the beautiful princess fell in love with either the prince or the warrior. Now the warrior specialized in what occupation? Killing. Was the person a, who was able to kill usually a good listener? <laughs> was he usually in touch with his feelings? But yet the girl didn't choose the conscientious objector who might have been the better listener, more sensitive, more in touch with his feelings. She chose the killer, the warrior, or the prince who could able, be able to provide. The current version of the prince is the doctor, the lawyer, the top engineer, the chairman of the board, the top author, um, whatever. And oftentimes they're so preoccupied becoming successful at work that they oftentimes don't know how to listen or be even at home. So the girls, girls historically were trained by their moms and dads to fall in love with the members of the other sex called men that were the least capable of loving very often. Conversely, males were also trained to fall in love with the members of the other sex who were the least capable of loving. They were trained to fall in love with the beautiful girl, 
not the girl who was, so what happens to the beautiful girl in life? She goes into a self-serve station and it becomes a full-serve station. <laughs> the gas station attendants compete to make it a full-serve station for her and she begins to learn the beautiful girl's metaphor of life, which is that what if, I have, if I'm beautiful and I have self-service prices, people will compete to give me full service for self-service prices. And my job will be to learn how to say no to the ones that, that don't compete effectively enough. And so through no fault of her own, the beauty often prepares her to feel entitled um, to getting men to compete for her love by giving her things or doing things for her. Conversely, it taught us to fall in love with the young woman. Why the young woman? Be the maximum number of years to bear children. Why, by the way, the beautiful woman? What was the, what was the genetic message behind that? What was beauty supposed to be about? Well, class, in, in fact, it was very much related to class. One of the reasons it was related to class also is what? It was related also to genes. The reason it became associated with good sex, which in fact it is not really truly involved with good sex. Oftentimes the most, the most beautiful women are not the most voluptuous women, the most sexual women. Um, it's in many ways quite the opposite. Um, the <laughs> Do not ask me how I got that information. <laughs> My doctorate was not focused on that issue. <laughs> um, we, where was I? <laughs> this, the, the, the beautiful <laughs> jeans. Thank you very much, <laughs> Calvin Klein's right jeans. <laughs> Um, the beautiful woman was basically the one that had, in some cultures had wider hips because she could bear children. Um, was cultures that where the, the fingernails were long because that indicated healthy fingernails, uh, uh, health. Um, the, the, um, the bone structure was um, parallel as opposed to off, off center like this because that, that meant a lack of deformity. The hair was healthy. It basically meant what that culture at that time considered healthy. So we addicted men in the culture to fall in love with the young woman maximum years of fertility, the beautiful woman, our definition of healthy in that culture, and then thirdly, um, the, the woman, and we, addict, we addicted the man to sex with that beautiful and young woman, and then we said, uh, uh by the way, before you have sex with her, you have to do what? You have to marry her. So in exchange for one act of sex, you're going to take care of her for a lifetime. <laughs> now, and we'll call that power. How many women would be likely to call it power if somebody said to you that in exchange for one act of sex you have to take care of that person for a lifetime? We don't have any morons here. Uh, so <laughs> and yet conversely women learn the same thing. In exchange for one act of sex they might have to do what? Lose their life in childbirth. They would also have to take care of the children for a lifetime, 18 to 20 years. So the point of stage one was that neither sex in stage one had power. They were both focused on survival. The whole issue of stage one, the reason our parents get so fed up with us, people like me who talk about self-fulfillment, is because in their lifetime, self-fulfillment was not a discussable topic. How to survive was a discussable topic. We were lucky enough as a result of them figuring out how to survive, we were lucky enough to be able to pursue self-fulfillment issues because they provided for us the luxury to be able to do that. But now with males and females, let's look at that issue. Basically until World War II, no males or females anywhere in the world, black, white, any background or race or ethnic um, um, variety, was able to focus on the issue of anything but survival. But after World War II,